Hello, one and all. It's Anthony Clark here from Small Talk Daily. And uh, in case you're wondering why the undergrad under uh, the lighting around me is uh, is all soft and uh, and gentle, it's because load shedding has hit me where I am. I'm currently with a dog in a little town called Romans Bay, which is about three and a half hours outside of Cape Town. So I'm coming to you live from uh, Robins Bay on my iPad. Luckily, I've got power backup with my Gizu. So we've got internet and uh, the fireplace is roaring. So as I was saying to my friends at Rand Swiss before we became online, this is a typical fireside chat, literally. Because if I turned my iPad right now to my right, you'd see the dog sleeping on the mat right beside a roaring log fire. So that's why I'm wearing a t-shirt because it's chilly outside, but it's cozier and warm in here. So this uh, presentation in, in, uh, in June is starting later because we thought we'd uh, attempt to allow more people to actually participate because a 5.30 time slot was perhaps a little bit too early for those battling through the traffic uh, to get home from work. And 6.30 is a far more elegant time for hopefully people to actually uh, listen in and uh, post some Q&As towards the end. So I'm hoping to go on for about uh, 40 to 50 minutes, although I'm uh, fairly free until 8 p.m. And then towards the end, we'll uh, open the, quest, the floor to Q&A. And uh, my dear friend at uh, Rand Swiss is monitoring all of this and questions will be posted. And if they're pertinent to the work that I do, I shall gladly answer where I can. So I always try and do a wrap up. So where are we right now on uh, June the 21st? It's been exactly one quarter since my last presentation. And uh, they say, you know, a month is a long time in politics. Now, three months is a long time in the life of politics and uh, a country like South Africa. We have seen endemic uh, rise in load shedding. We have seen a reporting season that has just basically passed, where numerous companies have come out and indicated the impacts of the crumbling infrastructure and the dysfunctional government onto their underlying business. If it's not roads, uh, if it's not water, if it's not power, if it's not uh, sky high inflation or food price inflation or the distressed consumer or rising interest rates, there are no end of problems hitting the economy um, right now. Interestingly, uh, some companies haven't been immune, but they've uh, been a little bit more resilient than others. So I, I, almost, I always start with how has the year started so far? I just checked the metrics before we came online, and year to date, um, the Aussie index is up 3.53%. The mid cap index is down 2.6%. But once again, the small cap index is holding its own, and year to date is only down 0.12%. Part of that has been there has been a dramatic sell off in the mid cap sector, particularly in the last three months. Um, the small caps have been somewhat immune purely because of liquidity. And I'll explain one of the reasons uh, in a short while. The most important feature has been Morand. Um, as it stands right now, before I uh, switched this recording on, Morand was at 18.38 of a dollar, which is down 8.2% year to date. At its weakest, about a month ago, we were at 19.82, down 16.7% uh, year to date showing you there's been a dramatic recovery in the RAND in the last uh, couple of weeks. It's amazing what running a few guns uh, will do to the economy and the currency um, as and when if it is proved. But as they say, an inquiry uh, is not meant to prove anything. It's just meant to keep the hands at bay. So let's see if that keeps the Biden administration and a goer off our backs. So to go back to why the mid cap market is down 2.6% Versus the all share, so versus the small cap, which is basically flat. You may know that there was a change in the Reg 28 offshore allowances by Treasury some time ago, allowing institutions to take more money uh, off the table domestically to invest offshore. And we have seen, uh, or I have seen from my uh, institutional client base, that many large institutions have actually started selling many of the larger liquid mid caps with a domestic exposure to try and move the money offshore. And I'm sure you, you may have seen significant selling uh, in many mid caps, which I'll be talking about in the course of the next half an hour to 40 minutes. That's been one of the key factors as to why the mid cap sector, I believe, has been weaker than the small caps because it has liquidity. Many of the small caps may also have a, a period of distress in the underlying economy. I've just detailed to you with load shedding, interest rates and the consumer. But liquidity is an issue. 
So the fund manager has a sizable stake in a, in a small cap. It is much more difficult to try and exit that at a more equitable price compared to exiting a larger mid cap. So I've seen stocks between four and eight billion rand uh, sell off a little bit more than the smaller caps below two billion rand. And I expect that to continue. Not that there's anything wrong with the mid caps. It's just that people, taking, people are taking money off the table on an institutional basis. And as I give an interview, uh, to the Financial Mail a couple of weeks ago. I've been covering the small cap market domestically now for 30 consecutive years. And we are now approaching relative valuations that I have not seen for the best part of 10 or 12 years. There are many excellent companies with fairly solid prospects trading at large discounts to net asset value on extremely generous dividend yields. We have reasonably robust balance sheets and prospects trading on PEs of between threes and fives. Now, the lowest I ever saw it was back in the sell-off of March to April 2020, when the COVID calamity hit the world and the underlying JSC was slammed. In that period, we could actually buy very, very good companies on a P of two and three. And then in the following 12 to 18 months, we had the mother of all rallies in small to mid caps. So the mid cap index in 2021 was up over 50%. Even 2022, um, the small cap market did beat the Aussie, but here in 2023, given the hesitancy of the economy, interest rates, and all the factors we know about, there is a flight to safety and range head stocks, which is why the Aussie has just outperformed the mid cap and the small cap sector year to date. So that's a basic overact. If you see me reaching for my glass of water, it's because I'm talking away and I need to rehydrate myself. And it's quite warm in here. The fireplace, which you can't see, is, is basically giving me a, a lovely tan in my right arm. So in this segment, I thought I'd run through um, some of the really interesting stories that I have personally seen uh, in the last three months. Those of you that follow my work uh, know that I'm a big believer in kicking the tires. What that basically means is, you know, many of the pundits out there and the Instagram and the uh, Twitter followers tend to look at SENS and the underlying results which are in the newspapers or detail and just comment on that. I'm not that clever. I'm not an accountant. I'm just a simple ex-engineer uh, who's just happened to fall into this market and, uh, and do okay in life. So I tend to spend a great deal of my time actually engaging with management, going to see companies and actually talking to them and actually kicking the tires in the old, in the old fashioned way. So as an example, about a month ago, I took a flight to Durban and I spent the entire day a meeting with Arjun Industrial, Combined Motor Holdings and Grinrod. You know, that was my own time, my own expense. And I spent literally 12 hours uh, shuttling backwards and forwards, visiting these companies. And there's nothing better than actually staring a CEO in the eye and asking him fairly pertinent and pointed questions on an online forum like this. They can even mute uh, the screen, they can hide themselves away, and they can often duck questions by not even answering them. When you're sitting in a boardroom, uh, sipping a cup of tea or coffee, and you ask them a particularly tricky question, you can tell by their body language or even the nuances in their, in their facial features which way a question is potentially going to go. That's why I love face-to-face -face meet, face -face meetings. And I would urge anybody listening out there in the dark, uh, excuse the pun, to go to any investment presentations which are physically undertaken by any company. In the case of an annual general meeting or even the results presentations which many companies have physically started once again uh, undertaking in person. So I'm gonna start off with a company that uh, literally yesterday had one of the best um, investor capital days I have seen in quite some time. And that's a perennial favorite of mine called Afrimat. Um, as I speak to you right now, the stock is trading at 62 Rand. It was up 5.91% of close of business. And as I tweeted to my followers on Monday morning on my handle Small Talk Daily, um, I anticipated Afrimax to have a very good investor day. And the stock always runs on investor day because every single divisional director, director gives an overview on the prospects of the company. After the investor day, the share price at one point was up over 12.78%. So you could have bought this counter on a Monday morning at about 52 to 54 Rand. It's trading today at 62. 
So sometimes it pays to uh, keep an eye on what's going on re with regarding capital markets and specifically uh, with us old buggers who've been around a long time, who perhaps know the nuances and the market movements when investor days actually occur. And Aframath was a classic case in point. Uh, you could have easily have made eight to 10 rand a share purely just by knowing it was investor day and knowing they always give a very good update. So what was the key features from Afrimat? Well, in my mind, they kicked off with a transaction. Afrimat, since it's listed in 2006, has been a very acquisitive company. They tend to do a deal every 18 months. Now, again, because I've covered this stock since 2006 uh, concurrently, their first transaction was a small company they bought from Exaro uh, in the industrial mineral space called Glenn Douglas. They paid 30, 35 million rand for it way back in the day. After they'd restructure it, put in some decent capital and you know, reorganize the company to do things the Afrimat way, which is lean and mean and efficient. Glenn Douglas, within a matter of years, was making exactly the same profit per annum as Afrimat had paid for the company originally. So a slew of acquisitions have followed from Glenn Douglas, Cape Lime, Infrasource, Clinker Group, uh, Dero Iron Ore, amongst others. Uh, the latest one is called Lafarge. Now, Lafarge may, may be known to some of you out there as being one of the country's uh, cement companies. It's actually owned by the global Swiss cement giant called Holcim. But again, because I've been around a long time, uh, Holcim, uh, when it bought uh, Alpha, renamed it Lafarge. Uh, Alpha used to be uh, a rename of Blue Circle. Blue Circle used to be a British company which had been operating in this country for over a hundred years. And then Blue Circle internationally was bought out by Holcim uh, and the circle turns. So basically, as it stands right now, uh, the old Lafarge has gone back to being uh, owned by a domestic company. Afrimat did a bargain basement deal. Uh, from the sense that was announced yesterday at about 7.30, they indicated to the market that they are paying six million US dollars for Lafarge, which in round numbers is around 110 million rand, plus the assumption of 900 million rand of debt. 500 million rand of that debt will be paid fairly immediately on the deal's success, and that should close out towards the end of the year, once the varying uh, regulatory bodies and uh, competition commissions, et cetera, et cetera, have approved a transaction. And then the remaining 400 million rand will be repaid in 12 months time, interest free. So in theory, Afrimat is paying about a billion rand for this company, but they actually aren't. Because for those of us that cover the sector quite closely and look at listed and unlisted companies, and I do, because I cover the cement company and the cement sector quite closely, inside Lafarge, there's 200 million rand of net cash. So if you strip that net cash out of the underlying acquisition cost, Afrimat's are buying the company for 800 million rand. Now, interestingly, in the SENS disclosure, they state that Lafarge is marginally profitable. It makes between 35 and 38 million rand a year. Now, on first glance, you may say that's not a great deal of money. But the SENS also says that last year, the company made 311 million rand. So there was a substantial fall in profit year on year. I understand that the parent company has been desperate to get out of this country for all the reasons we know about load shedding, politics, the currency, the labor situation, the weak market, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, with the profits being down quite materially, Afrimat has snapped itself a bargain. So in speaking to the company yesterday during its investor day, they were fairly confident but by going in and investing about 325 million rand of capital to improve the underlying uh, operational efficiencies of the companies, uh, and the, the management is actually fairly sound, uh, it just needs to be tweaked at the sidelines. Afrimat believes it can get to an 8 to 10% margin for Lafarge. Now, why is that interesting? Because, again, it wasn't disclosed in the sense, but I know that Lafarge has an annual revenue of 3.5 billion rand. So if it gets back to an 8 to 10% margin, you're looking at an annualized profit of between 300 to 350 million rand from a company that was making a tenth of that in the last reporting period. So if Afrimat can work its magic, which is done on every single deal that is done 
since 2006. This could be one of the best deals that the Ackerman has done in his entire listed history. So in the business day this morning, for those of you who read the article, I was on record as saying, this could be the best deal that Ackerman has done in the last century. Just use a parable. So in theory, this deal could become self-financing in two to two and a half years. And Ackerman has basically taken a gamble, but a calculated strategic gamble that the current cement market is, has bottomed. The lack of investment in this country is about to turn and varying economic indicators, which we can all see online with the Bureau of Economic Research and Stats SA indicate that perhaps the bottom has turned. And Afrimat mentioned yesterday in his presentation, the likes of Sandroll and other um, private and uh, government bodies are beginning to spend, means that the cement and aggregates transaction could be one of the best deals that Afrimat had done. But let me just finish this transaction and, this, and say this deal is not about cement. So don't get scared that Afrimat is now competing against PPC and Mambo and Sapaku and everybody else in the cutthroat cement market. This deal is basically about the extenders and what goes in to blended cement. Lafarge has a nationwide uh, distribution and quarry network of about 11 operating quarries and about seven or eight mothballed quarries. So in one foul stroke of a pen, Afrimat now becomes the leading national company in the supply of construction material aggregates. It has a dual business called Fly Ash, which is one of the key extenders in uh, blended cement. It has a grinding plant in Gauteng and a, a blending plant also in Gauteng, which means it's now vertically integrated. So it should be able to produce cement at a much lower cost compared to other competitors who have to buy in varying products to make the cement. So in my, in my life, I look for companies which actually have a strategic intent to keep the earnings momentum inside its company going. So this year, Afrimax basically had a fairly flat year to slightly down because the iron ore price was down on a like-on-like -like basis. From memory, earnings were down about 15% in round numbers. Going into the new financial year to February 2024, the impact of Jenkins Iron Ore and Unkamati Amphrasite will start to power earnings for this company. In 2025, the benefits of the Glenover phosphates business starts to kick in. And now the Lafarge business will start to kick in in 2026. So what I'm trying to indicate to the listeners out there in the dark is that Affirmat now has a runway of at least three or four years earnings growth ahead of it. And that is one of the compelling reasons why I have Afrimat as a continual buy. I have a target value of 80 Rand, and I'm probably gonna upgrade that to about 85 Rand uh, in the next six to 12 months, depending if the iron ore price stays fairly stable at about $113, and if a Rand doesn't strengthen too much further. So Afrimat to me at 62 Rand, even though you could have bought this stock at, at between 52 and 54 on Monday, and it's now run up quite sharply, it's still a quality stock to have in, uh, in any long-term portfolio. And on any weakness, for whatever reason, um, I would be a buyer of the stock. I'm now gonna move on to another company which uh, I engaged with on Monday, which was Omnia. Omnia as it stands right now is trading at 60 Rand and 70 cents. Uh, it was trading at about 50 Rand about a month ago. It ran to a high of 65 on the anticipation of results. And with no trading update, the market clearly thought that the earnings coming out would not be great. And the share price started to weaken. And uh, today closed up 1.4% to 60 Rand and 17 cents. In results that came out Monday, for its year ended March 2023, it showed a 10% increase in headline earnings per share to 7 Rand 42 and paid a 36% increase in dividend to 3 Rand 75. Uh, on the results that came out on Monday and on the webinar, the share price was down 6% on the day. And I think that's a combination of factors. One, because the markets were expecting a special dividend, which they didn't get, but they still got a very juicy final dividend of 3 Rand 75, as I said, up 36%. And the company also announced a 10% share buyback, which means that at Omnia 
will be buying back roughly 16.1 million shares for a capital sum of around 1 billion rand. And that should be seen as a great supporting um, structure for the share price going forward. I understand that Omnia itself thinks the share is highly undervalued. And I think that they believe a share price should be trading nearer to 80 rand, not 60. So a combination of a company which is debt-free, has a very strong balance sheet, is doing a share buyback, and in the last uh, two and a half years, has paid back to shareholders 17 rand 75 in dividends, with a current share price of 60 rand and 17 cents. When the rights issue that happened uh, in late 2020 was a 20 rand, has certainly delivered the goods for underlying shareholders. So one of the reasons why I think the market sold off the company was one, no special dividend, and two, there's a misconception that the underlying agricultural cycle for Omnia going into 20, 2024 will not be as good as the last couple of years. In reality, that could be true. In actuality, it isn't. As I tried to explain to clients yesterday and to the assembled media who I gave interviews to, the Omnia of 10 years ago, which was highly cyclical, has evolved and the very volatile nature we have seen in the company is now very, very gentle. It has restructured its company, it is operationally more efficient, it has cut costs and it has expanded its interest in explosives and agriculture internationally. That international now gives a RAND hedge and we saw in these Omnia results that Omnia International, which is basically organic um, fertilizers, saw 50% rise in the underlying contribution. And this company has been growing extremely strongly for the last few years. Similarly, BME, the explosives division, had very strong growth internationally in Canada, Indonesia, and is looking to expand into other parts of North America and Australasia. Domestically, the agricultural sector was down 8% because the fertilizer market was beset by a declining uh, volume and basically weakened fertilizer prices because during the price of COVID, fertilizer prices ran very, very hard. And then we had the Russian-Ukrainian crisis where Belarus and Russia were global exporters of potash, phosphates and fertilizers were precluded from the market. We then had a natural gas shortage in Europe which meant that many ammonia plants were offline. And in 2022, the fertilizer prices went through the roof. And any company, both locally and internationally, involved in fertilizer were making more money than God. Excuse my, my parable there. As the fertilizer market has started no to normalize, the super profits have come down. But I can tell you that the, the fertilizer prices today are still significantly stronger than they were post-COVID. So the bottom has not fallen out of the fertilizer market. Many of you may be concerned that the weather changing uh, patterns in this country from a very wet and uh, fairly subdued La Nina back to a hotter and dry El Nino expected for next year might see farmers decide to plant less. I can tell you that's not going to happen. How can I be so sure? Because for the last um, few months, we've had extremely wet weather in this country. And anyone that uh, sees my notes on a regular basis will see that I track the underlying soil moisture levels in this country. And satellite images go, goes down to two meters. And you can actually see there is sufficient moisture in the key agricultural areas in this country to support very good pre-planting pre and the planting season and the growing season. So if we do get a hotter, drier period in 2024, the plants will be well established. So even if we get average rain, I'm still looking for farmers to plant very good levels of hectares next year, probably switching back to more maize compared to soya, because the maize price is, uh, is fairly resilient and the soya price has come down. And as such, the farmers need to re-nutrify the soil. So anybody that thinks it's all fall down for Omnia next year in agriculture, I think will be sadly mistaken. The explosive science is doing well, uh, despite that uh, global recession is possibly in the, in the air. Internationally, the commodities market is holding up. And in the presentation that uh, Omnia gave, and in the one-on-one -on -one that I had, which was the first one after the results presentation, they indicated to me that the Southern African Development Region, SADC, 
is actually seeing a very good resumption in mining activity as old mines are resuming again and the demand for fertilizer uh, is beginning to kick up as well as explosives. So all in all at 60 Rand, you've got a company debt free, which is paying very good dividends, doing a share buyback and trading on a price earnings ratio of eight times where the underlying past cyclicality has been smoothed. So I would certainly watch Omnia for any um, growth and dividend fund but once a solid counter with a 10 billion rand market cap, which should be well supported going forward by reasonable earnings growth, solid dividends, and of course the share buyback. I'm now gonna kick on to a firm favorite of I'm sure many in the, in the audience out there. And I'm gonna talk about Renogen. And I was gonna save the stock until last to make sure that you all hung on listen to me but uh, you never know with load shedding and i wanted to get the the jewels out uh, in the start now renogen for all of you listening out there has been incredibly volatile for the last 12 months um one of my uh, followers on twitter uh, put out a chart of the international natural gas price and overlaid it with renogen and it was a very close coloration and as the natural gas price which hit a high of eight dollars a million metric British thermal units uh, middle of last year, Renogen was at an all-time high. And as the gas price internationally started to normalize, as the world weaned itself off Russian gas, um, the natural gas price bottomed at about $1.88 per million metric British thermal unit, and it's currently trading at around $2.40. So Renogen is a very interesting article even though it's not a natural gas company because it produces LNG and helium in this country. And we as a country need energy and helium is a globally in demand commodity. Renogen let the market down in the last 12 months by perpetually missing deadlines for the implementation of Virginia phase one LNG and of course the production of helium. That alongside a combination of uh, equity placements at varying prices from 36 Rand down to the last one of 24, really annoyed the market where there was delays in the project. There was a constant flow of uh, shares being placed and there was no real news. But all of that changed late last year when liquid natural gas or LNG started to be produced. Helium was then produced uh, a few months after that. And as it stands right now, all the LNG that uh, Religion is, is producing at Virginia phase one has been contracted to Ital Tile, Console Glass, and to Timelink, which is a Western Cape-based transportation company. And the helium is being sold under contract to one of the world's largest uh, gases company called Linde. Now, there was a sense out in early June, which caught a mar market's imagination. We all know that Virginia phase two is gonna cost about 21 billion rand, which in round numbers is about eight to 10 times larger than the current market value of Renogen. All of that is gonna be financed through a combination of debt and the potential of a NASDAQ listing which should occur, I would imagine in the middle of September this year. The sense that came out in early June uh, basically told the market that the Development and Finance Corporation, the DFC, which is basically a funding arm of the US government had approved um, a loan of 500 million US dollars to Renogen. On the back of that, Standard Bank also approved a $250 million loan. So Renogen had secured $750 million. But there were conditions precedent to that loan being approved. That condition precedent, as the SENS article detailed, was Congress, which is basically the uh, government of the United States actually rubber stamping the DFC's application for funding. Now, anybody that follows Renogen quite closely and who reads the circulars and who reads the underlying fine print in any of the uh, documents that they put out would know that once the DFC has approved a loan, it goes to Congress and Congress have 14 days to actually deliberate, cogitate, and query that application. If there are no queries, if there are no discussions, 
it gets rubber stamped and the loan basically gets passed. Um, I would suggest that that 14 days is up today. Perhaps by the close of business New York time today, if there's been no objections from Congress, very quickly, Renogen could in theory gain its 750 million US dollars funding. That will be a major milestone. So all of us doubting Thomases on Twitter and social media and the newspapers who thought that Renogen would not get the money may have to eat their words and their humble pie, perhaps in the next week, if indeed Congress did rubber stamp the DSE's application. We should know in the coming days. Nothing I'm telling you is privy information. All the information is out there. But you'd have to read the small print to realize it's 14 days after the DFC's approval that Congress can rubber stamp. That 14 days is probably up right now. So I would very um, uh, carefully watch SENS uh, in the coming weeks to see if, it, if this ratification has occurred. Now, in the last couple of uh, weeks, Renogen has run from 18 Rand to 24, then straight back down, up and down, up and down. And I would think that if this transaction goes through, this would be a, a significant milestone for the company. We've also got NASDAQ riding at an all-time high. The, the Dow is at a record level, and the underlying IPO market in the States is also picking up. So given we are now moving into the summer season in the US, um, no real IPOs will occur, but what will occur is the underlying mechanics and the roadshow for the listing will start to gather momentum. Again, this is all public information. Um, the main book runners or the people handling the IPO uh, of, uh, of Renogen in the States is Credit Suisse. Credit Suisse is now owned by the global banking giant Union Bank of Switzerland. And I also led to believe at Standard Bank, who are providing $250 million of additional funding are also now a book runner. So we've now got three very competent, very large banks handling the IPO and the underlying marketing and book running for this IPO. So I would imagine that uh, in the coming weeks and months, you will see more news coming out regarding the SEC filing and all the varying documentation. And then news will be coming out regarding how Barosha was participating, uh, how the stock is being placed, what the placing price is, has the stock been successful? Uh, was, it, was, it over, was it oversubscribed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So as I wrote in a Financial Mail article back in March, there are a number of significant milestones that Renogen have to tick in order to rebuild confidence in the stock. We have so far seen a number of major milestones ticked off. If Congress does indeed approve a DFC's loan application, that'll be a significant milestone going into the NASDAQ listing, which should really boost investor confidence in the company. So it's certainly one to keep an eye on. As I said from day one, Renogen is not a stock for widows and orphans. It is very volatile. And I'm often criticized for talking about the stock, particularly for those that were in a, at, higher, at higher levels. Um, I believe in the stock is a stock that I have owned for quite a long time. I was in it around 12 Rand. And it's certainly one that I think in the long term will generate sig significant amounts of profit and ultimately dividends. But that's not going to come until 2027, 2028. Until then, a number of tick, tick points has to occur. And as I said, I will certainly keep an eye out in the coming week to see if a Congress has approved the Renogen DFC loan. So hopefully that will uh, add some uh, fuel to the Renogen shareholders. The other interesting thing is uh, an exercise was done uh, a few weeks ago to ascertain why the Renogen share price was so weak. And if you ask for script lending books in this country, these are people that lend out shares for hedge funds and others to go short of the stock. Um, we ascertained that between five and six million shares in Renogen were short in the marketplace. So people were betting the share price would go down so they could buy back at low levels and actually make a difference as a profit. If uh, uh, good news is coming out in the coming weeks and months on this stock, many of those people short will be scurrying to cover uh, the shares that they've let, that they've borrowed, and they now have to give back to the books. So we might, we might see another short squeeze. 
We've already seen two where the share price went from 18 Rand to 24 and promptly went down again. So I would certainly keep an eye out on the underlying trading and volume in Renogen in the coming weeks and months. We may see the short sellers squeezed once again, but we shall see. I'm keeping an eye on my time. So let me just check um, what it is. Bear with me one second, because I have no idea what the time is. It is uh, five past seven. So I'll keep on going for another 15, 20 minutes. Another stock that has become very popular um, in the markets in the last uh, few weeks has been Arjun Industrial. Again, for those of you that have listened into this presentation in the past, I've been recommending Argent uh, for a number of years. I first recommended the stock back in March 2019 at 3 Rand 52. As I stand today, it's trading at 15 Rand 79, up 0.59% today. And compared to the movement in the JSC small cap index, the stock has more than tripled. So it's outperformed the underlying index by over 300%. It is not a common stock owned by institutions. Only a couple of institutions actually own the stock with a market value of around 880 million rand. In a recent trading update uh, for its March 2023 year end, the company indicated its headline earnings per share will be up between 11% and 31% for the period. They earned 3 rand 39 last year, and the guidance this year roughly is around 4 rand 11 which brings the PE down to this company to around 3.9 times. I'm forecasting a, a total dividend of a year of about 95 cents to a rand, which gives a solid dividend yield of 6%. The net asset value is trading at around 26 rand, and the share price is trading at 16. And as I said, the price earnings ratio on a mid guidance to its recent trading update is under four times. And I'm forecasting earnings to March 2024 of a minimum of five rand, which brings the price earnings ratio down to just around three times. So why is the market ignoring the stock? It's a combination of legacy reasons. The CEO, Treve Henry, is a very colorful entrepreneur who's not exactly um, in fashion with what I would call the mainstream blue chip institutions in this country. To them, uh, a businessman needs, needs to have a certain degree of gravitas, needs to wear a suit, needs to have gone to the right school, and you know, needs, to, needs to talk in a certain fashion. Treve Henry is none of this. He's a classic businessman who knows how to kick the tires and run his businesses extremely well and extremely profitable. So what, have, what has Arjun been doing for the last three years? It has been selling off low margin businesses in this country where the unions have caused no end of havoc. We've had load shedding and problems with the underlying economy. They've sold off excess property and have recycled that money into doing material share buybacks. They've bought back circa 40% of their shares in issue. And all of that money, they've bought niche operations predominantly in the United Kingdom. In the United Kingdom, for those of you that uh, know the market, and you can tell that I'm not from here, I moved here 30 years ago, so I'm well aware of the foibles and the regulations in the British market. The, the market in the UK is driven by health and safety. You can't put a foot outside your door without health and safety sticking their finger in saying you can't do this or you have to do this and that in a certain way. So Arjun has bought companies which are directly impacted and benefit from regulation, from a movement of fuel to fire safety. Uh, to um, the, you know, the, the storage of certain types of uh, hazardous, ma hazardous materials. So these have natural moats because you need to have uh, an understanding of the operating environment in the UK. You need to buy established companies with long-term track records and reputation. And if you buy them at the right price, you can make a great deal of money. And I'm gonna give one classic example of how Arjun picks up amazing companies for next to nothing. During the height of COVID, one of the companies that they bought was called Fuel Transfer. It had the exclusive contracts to actually dispense fuel to aircraft in certain airports in the UK and to military airports. Now, as you can imagine, not anybody can walk on the apron of the runway 
uh, and specifically if you're carrying a combustible material like fuel. So there was licenses and regulations until the end of time. The company that Arjun bought called Fuel Transfer had been operating since the 1960s, a near 50 year track record of operating in some very key strategic and security conscious areas around the United Kingdom. But during COVID, what happened? Airports were closed, nobody flew, nobody wanted fuel. So the underlying family owners of fuel transfer basically had no money and the company basically went bust. Arjun stepped in, took out the intercompany loan and paid the grand sum of one pound, equivalent to today's price of 24 rand to buy the company. At that stage, it was loss making. They had to cover the intercompany loan. And in the last set of results, Fuel Transfer made a profit of 4.5 million pounds. That is roughly between 80 and 100 million rand, showing you that at the right time, you can buy great companies at great prices if you can look ahead and bite the bullet and bide and bide your time. This is what Arjun has done succinctly. It has bought really good companies at bargain basement prices restructured and then just sat back and wait. Um, a classic example again was Brexit. When the British people voted to leave uh, the European Union, many European countries did not want to operate in the UK because of a change of legislation and all the problems that that would bring to translation of their um, UK operations back into their home currencies. So what did they do? They sold off the UK divisions again at rock bottom prices. Who stepped in? Argent. They bought some really, really good companies at knockdown prices. So they are basically benefiting from Brexit and COVID. And I don't think there are many small caps out there that can say that they are flying high because of Brexit and COVID. Argent did. A combination of those transactions now means that 30% of the entire company's revenue is derived offshore and over 50% of the company's profit is generated in hard currencies. So with a company with a market value of circa 880 million rand, that's the last number that I have, the market also should be aware that they sit on 300 million rand of net cash offshore in dollars, euros, and pounds sterling. So if you strip out the cash from a market value of Argent, you aren't buying this business on a PE of 3.86 you're probably buying it on a P of less than three. And if you look then forward 12 months, you're probably buying a business on around a two times earnings for a company that will still grow year on year at over 20% and will continue to pay very solid dividends going forward and is only trading at 15 Rand 79. So for anyone out there looking for a Rand hedge company in the small to mid cap space, Despite the fact the stock has gone from 3 Rand 52 in March 2019 to 15 Rand 79 as of today, there are still legs in this company. I have a short term target price of 18 Rand. And I think, in, and, and I will not think, I uh, know moving into 2024, I'm certainly going to move a target up to at least 20, if not 22, because there aren't many quality companies out there sitting on Rand hedge earnings who are growing earnings, uh, investing in themselves, paying solid dividends, trading on a price earnings ratio of around three times. To me, Argent is one of the more sparkling gems in the micro to small cap market, which the greater institutional market continues to ignore. It's a perfect stock for private clients. And uh, if I didn't have any in a portfolio, again, I would wait for an off day, pick some up, sit back and wait, I think you'll make a very nice return in the years to come. Another sip of water. Another company that I've been very fond of since June last year, in fact, the entire sector is a fishing sector. Um, I recommended Omnia, so I recommended Oceana, my apologies, uh, at 56 Rand and 39 cents back in June last year with a 72 Rand target. It made that target and exceeded it. And in the last few weeks, the stock has weakened back to 68 Rand 60, despite having delivered really good results at its recent uh, uh, reporting period. Om 
I keep saying Omnia. I've got Omnia on the brain. Oceana um, is a fishing company, but it's not a classic fishing company. The bulk of its business is made in US dollars, but its fish meal business in the States called Daybrook. In the recent results, much of the profit in Oceana came from two significant divisions. One was Daybrook in terms of international fish meal, and secondly, a product that you all know well, Lucky Star canned fish. Oceana sells 200 million cans of Lucky Star a year, and in these difficult economic times, when consumers' purses and wallets are stretched, food price inflation is rampant, there is no real um, uh, economic or wage growth, consumers, particularly at the lower end, are looking to eke out uh, their money in buying affordable foods to feed themselves and their families. And Lucky Star has been a significant beneficiary of this trend. In Oceana's case, there are a couple of very interesting factors which lead me to believe that they've got some significant tailwinds behind them that, as I wrote recently, uh, could see 18 months of solid growth in front of a company. Uh, I'm going to let you in on a small little tit, a tidbit. Um, if you buy this week's financial mail and the investor's monthly supplement is in there, I have a one-page feature on Oceana. It is certainly worth a read as to why I think the stock has got 18 months of growth ahead of it and why I think the current share price of 68 Rand and 60 cents is undervalued. And I have a target price of between 86 and 88 Rand in the stock. So why do I think they've got tailwinds? One is Peru, the South American country. Why is that important? Because anyone that knows fishing knows that Peru is the single largest producer of fish meal in the world. Fish meal is used in the uh, production of aquaculture, predominantly in China, and it's also the main ingredient into pet food globally, particularly in the United States. And as we all know, during COVID, everybody, excuse the pun, ran out and uh, bought a cat or a dog to keep themselves company. And there's been a huge rise in the underlying pet ownership, uh, particularly in Western markets. And as we all know, everybody loves their pets and poor Fluffy always has to be fed, which means there's been an exponential demand for quality pet food from major Western markets in Europe and specifically in the United States. Peru is no longer producing as much fish meal as it should because a changing weather pattern there has meant that its annual quota of 3 million tons is now being cut to a million tons so there is, there is a global shortage of fish meal. What does that mean? It's supply and demand. If there's, a, if there's a lack of supply, prices go up. And in Daybrook's case, which is owned by Oceana, the international price of fish meal is, is at a near 30 year high. Daybrook catching their uh, anchovies and all their fish species in the Gulf of Mexico from April until October are fishing extremely well. They have very, very good stockpiles of products in their warehouses, and they indicate that they are making uh, money uh, as the sun shines because the species is plentiful, the price is high, the demand is there, there's a growth in aquaculture, and of course the pet market remains fairly resilient. With a rand dollar at uh, 1830 as it stands, it is materially weaker year on year, aiding the translation benefits of Oceana's offshore earnings, which means that Daybrook will continue to power at least half of Oceana's earnings for the next 12 to 18 months. Then you've got the domestic operations. You've got domestic fishing, which is for the local and the export market, and Lucky Star. Lucky Star is actually using its very well-known and trusted brand to extend its name into complementary products of soya-based derivatives and other canned foods. We all know that um, Rhodes Foods via its bull brand has a range of soya alternatives, corned meats, et cetera, et cetera. Lucky Star is moving into that market, realizing that the consumer who just trusted its brand for the best part of 60 years knows that the quality of its Lucky Star brand will probably be as good in complementary ranges of canned goods. So I'm anticipating that Lucky Star, which in the last reporting period, actually made a slight dip in its results, purely because 
it strategically didn't pass on a price increase to try and increase volumes. It then pushed a 9% price increase through, and that 9% price increase should kick in into the second half alongside significantly higher volumes of Lucky Star products. So from my mind, Oceana at 68 Rand and 60 cents has got 18 months of very solid growth ahead of it. There, there will be good debt reduction, solid dividend payments, and hopefully good capital appreciation. For those that missed Oceana in my recommendation last year, 56 Rand, the alternative play would be Sea Harvest. Sea Harvest isn't exactly the same as Oceana because it's predominantly a fishing company. So what it catches, it sells, either locally or internationally. It has no fish meal. It's involved with aquaculture in Abalone exporting into the Far East. The main reason why Sea Harvest has been weak so far year to date, the stock is down about 20%. It's trading currently at 9 Rand 81, unchanged on the day. I have a target price of 13 Rand 50. It is the PIC. The government-owned pension fund is the second largest shareholder after Brimstone, the empowerment company, that owns 54%. Brimstone, coincidentally, is also the largest shareholder in Oceana, owning 25%. So the PRC decided in its infinite wisdom to basically start selling its sea harvest shares and basically drilled the company down. Um, I believe that the last of the selling occurred last week. Um, some of my institutional clients were buying the stock and they are smiling from ear to ear at buying a huge block of shares from a PIC at bargain basement prices in a stock that is normally illiquid. It's got great rand hedge benefits. Many of the problems it encountered last year, which was one, the cut in the underlying amount of fish it could catch because of government regulation, which saw its underlying fish catch cut, cut by 10%. We then had the oil price boom last year because of the Russian-Ukrainian crisis where oil prices more than doubled. So it couldn't adjust its cost base quickly enough to cope with two extraneous factors that hit the company in a matter of months. It's now adjusted itself. The oil price as I speak is trading below $70 a barrel. This time last year it was trading at 115. The international price of whitefish continues to be very strong. The RAND is materially weaker year on year, and Sea Harvest is a material beneficiary of, re of RAND weakness, given it exports its business. And with China reopening, the number of flights and the preponderance of the Chinese, a bit like everybody else nationally, internationally, to want to leave their homes to eat out again is beginning to tick up. So I'm, in, I'm anticipating the losses in aquaculture to start swinging to a break even and a profit in the next 12 months. So in Sea Harvest's case, what are the strong factors? One, the oil price is lower, aiding its cost base. Two, the rand is weaker, aiding its translation benefits. Three, globally, whitefish is in strong demand because Russian sanctions mean that much of the Russian fish is not available to certain Western markets. And we're looking for alternative sources of supply. Sea Harvest can supply because fish, unlike wheat, or any other product, you simply cannot grow more. You have to wait for the fish in the sea to actually grow before you can catch it, and then there's quotas. You then got the reopening of a Chinese market, and once again, international freight rates for shipping goods from this country to China are now back to around COVID levels. Um, so they've fallen quite materially. So the earnings in the last reporting period fell quite sharply by about 30% to rand and five cents. I'm forecasting a nice 20 to 25% increase in earnings in the next 12 months, back to between 135 and 140 cents a share. And at 9 Rand 81, I'm believing that once all of this news starts to filter out into the market, once the interim results to June start to appear, and then the second half starts to kick in, but Sea Harvest at 9 Rand 81 will start moving higher because on a relative valuation, it has significantly underperformed Oceana. So I would not sell my Oceana to move into Sea Harvest. But if I didn't have Oceana, I would certainly look at Sea Harvest to try and catch, or should I say hook, some of the benefits that are coming in the fishing sector that Sea Harvest has got coming in the next 12 months. So on that note, I'm going to take a bit of a pause, drink some water, and just check the Q&A. 
Let me see if I can see my screen here. Uh, where are we? Where is my q and A? I'm terrible at technology, so I'm going to try and find it. Okay, if you see me looking at the screen, it's because I'm reading with a tiny little little light here. So I'll I'll see what I can actually see. I, and I'll, if I squint, it's because it, because I've, I've I've got I've got terrible eyesight. Um, I have a stock which you've not covered. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Oh, you, you, there's a question here on RCL food. Uh, RCL food, uh, or rainbow chicken as it used to be known, has been one of the worst performing food counters for over 20 years. Uh, it is 80% owned by Rembrandt and is an agglomeration of a combination of businesses from Food Corp, Rainbow Chicken, uh, Sugar Businesses, and is recently sold Vecta Logistics. Um, everyone hopes that Rembrandt will buy out the company and then merge into um, RCL. It's Cicala uh, Oils business, which uh, it owns privately. But Rembrandt moves at a glacial pace. So RCL to me is one of those companies which, if you've been in the stock for 20 years, quite frankly, you've made absolutely zero money. The share price has gone absolutely nowhere. Uh, it has been one of my least favorite counters for quite some time. The entire world has been waiting for Rembrandt to buy the company out, but nothing has happened to date. They have started to tinker on the sidelines. They recently sold Vector Logistics, so they further try to, re to refine, refine the portfolio. And the market is well aware at some stage, Rainbow Chickens, which has been a very cyclical and volatile part of RCL, will hopefully be spun off and listed separately. But there is no timeline to that. So right now, uh, RCL Foods, to me, quite frankly, is dead money. Uh, it's, it's gone nowhere in 20 years, and I have no reason to suddenly rush in. Um, I'm looking down here uh, at more questions. I'm just going to scroll through. Um, uh, I'm, I'm just asking on, uh, on, on, uh, on, on random here. Uh, bear with me, I'm looking again. Uh, Adam asks, how do you compare uh, Argent, sorry, uh, da, 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 da. How, do you, how does Argent compare to Invicta? Is there an overlap in the products? The answer is no. Um, Argent is basically in metal beneficiation. Uh, it, takes, it takes bare metal and it turns it into things like filing cabinets, beds, lockers, jet master fireplaces. It owns expander security doors, amongst other things. Whereas Invicta, basically is a supplier of what I would call spare parts, nuts and bolts and widgets and fan belts and conveyor belts and any number of products. So there is no comparison between Argent and Invicta. Um, they operate in the industrial space, but in terms of the underlying business combinations, they are as different as chalk and cheese. Um, any thoughts on Deneb Investments, says Anonymous. Now, Deneb is a stock that I personally own. Uh, it is part of the HCI stable. Uh, I actually had a meeting with the, with the CEO quite some time ago, and it has some extremely interesting assets inside the industrial portfolio. It is a, it is a small cap with a market value of less than a billion rand. Let me move that light closer. Um, and it's a spider's web of very interesting industrial businesses, ranging from photocopiers to toys, uh, to gaming equipment, to the production of high-end uh, technical fabrics and fire retardant products. Um, the trouble with Deneb is it's highly, highly illiquid. Uh, HCI is a majority shareholder, so it's not a stock that I can uh, uh, recommend that anybody run out and buy. It's been a fairly consistent performer. It's trading at a very low price earnings ratio, but because of a very light, a very tight liquidity, it's not a stock in good conscience that I would recommend it to anybody because it's difficult to get in and even more difficult to get out. So let me scroll away again. See what uh, has popped up. Calgro M3. No, I don't cover Calgro M3. Uh, Fush, uh, Fush says, welcome to Hans Bay. Thank you. I'm very happy here. Um, I've got a question here on Carp Agri. What are your thoughts on Carp Agri as a small cap? Fair value on the share price, and since the split of, and since the split of Zeta, it has just tanked. Uh, great question. Um, as, a, as a refresher, Carp Agri, uh, or KAL Group, as it's now called, um, is a retail business, 
And in 2022, there were two significant liquidity events. One, uh, Zeta Investments unbundled its 42% stake in Carp Agri, which saw a wash of shares hit the market. And then when PSG unbundled itself in September, all of the shares it inherited from a Zeta unbundling were also hit on the marketplace. So the start of 2022, Carp Agri was flying high, trading at around 48 Rand a share. And then suddenly about 32 million shares flooded the market. Institutions got the stock. Most people didn't know what the company actually was. And when institutions get a stock, they don't know what it is. They just generally sell. So I often say that the two companies that I spent more time educating my institutional clients on uh, in 2022 were Carp Agri and CA and S Sales. As it stands right now, Carp Agri is trading uh, at around 36 to 37 Rand. It earned 5 Rand 78 last year. I'm forecasting earnings this year of 6 Rand 75. Uh, the interim results were up just under 9%, and it paid a 50 cents dividend. The second half is normally weaker than the first half, purely because the first half, uh, you account for the wheat harvest that's coming in. On a price earnings ratio of around six times, Carp Agri is one of those unique retailers. Uh, I actually gave a presentation this morning to a client, and my example in Carp Agri is, you name me, any retailer listed in this country, we just had a 15-year track record of compound average growth rates of between 14 and 16%, rising dividends, trading on a price earnings ratio of six. I dare you to name you one. There isn't. So Carp Agri is a, is a misnomer. Everybody thinks it's an agricultural business, but less than 25% of its revenue is derived from agriculture. Given the transactions it has done in the last two years, it is now mainly a retailer involved in general merchandise, fuel retailing, and convenience stores. Load sharing actually benefits this company because as we all leave work or run around looking to get uh, food to the end of the day, what is generally open? The fuel station. And they always have a little convenience store, be it a Woolies or a pick and pay or a, or a fresh stop or any form of convenience store tackle on side. You know, we have a KFC, a Steers, et cetera, et cetera. So the convenience store offering of Carp Agri is growing leaps and bounds. Uh, I had a, an update of a company uh, a few weeks ago, and they said on a like-on-like -like basis, the convenience store business is growing up between 25 and 35% per annum, which is not a bad lick for a company trading on a PE of six. I've owned Carp Agri since seven Rand 30, and I have said in numerous presentations and online, but it's one of the retailing stocks that I will never sell. Um, currently, um, it's got a fair bit of debt on the balance sheet. Well, it's not a fair amount. Uh, it took on around 600 million rand from a nearly 3 billion rand market value to pay for the PEG fuel transaction, which, which it uh, started in November 2021. As that debt is repaid, in about three or four years' time, this company will start to generate significant amounts of free cash flow. So I've estimated by, by 2025, 2026, which may not be uh, that far away, this company could be delivering excess cash equivalent of two rand a share in additional dividends. So not only do you have a company trading on a P of six, which is cheap for the retailing sector, is a resilient company in an area of the economy, uh, agriculture, which is actually growing despite the fact it is less than 25% of revenue because it, it's involved in the export nature of wine and food and other areas. It'll have significant cash flow from underlying convenience stores and from fuel retailing. For, so for me, Carp Agri at the current level is an actually compelling buy, and I have a target value of a stock of 54 Rand. So let me scroll down because the questions are coming in thick and fast here. Uh, how about Capitec? Capitec, sir, Harry, it's not a small cap. It's never going to cross my life. Transaction capital, uh, as I've been tweeting today, and as I wrote in my financial mail article last month at 7 Rand 42, I, I'm unable to give a, a, a recommendation in transaction capital. 35 billion Rand of value has been lost 
in the last few months. And as I wrote in my Financial Med article, I am not strong enough, uh, even despite the gym that I do, to catch a falling piano. And uh, as of uh, the close of business today, I think uh, transaction capital has done another uh, 15 or 16 percent. Um, I'm not prepared to, uh, to comment on uh, transaction capital because I'm not strong enough to catch a falling piano. Uh, let me switch, scroll through. Uh, the writing here is very small. Do I cover Marafi? The answer is no. Um, Santova, uh, I've talked about that way too much in the past. I'm going to skip that. Um, I've got quite a few questions coming up here on Grinrod. Uh, in fact, there's four questions on Grinrod. Um, I told you at the start of this presentation that I was in Durban um, about a month ago. So I'm going to hold that light up because it's getting very, very dark in here. I was in Durban uh, about a month ago seeing combined motor holdings, Argent and Grinrod. It was a Grinrod annual general meeting and the stock was trading at the time at around 9 Rand 40. I think today it's trading at around 10 Rand from, from memory. In fact, it's trading at 10 Rand and 7 cents, a 0.7% today. I've written on numerous occasions that Grinrod to me remains one of my special situations uh, in the market. It's one of the very few companies that has a very profitable business uh, with existing operations in port and in uh, railways and is benefiting, quite frankly, from a mess the government is doing at Transnet and in Portnet. We all know that government is now looking to do public-private partnerships to get the private sector in to help sort out the inherent mess that the state-owned uh, companies have got themselves into. The newspapers and the media have been littered with criticism over the last 12 months about the amount of product that has not been able to leave these shores into the uh, export market because of the inefficiencies and the, and the incompetence of Transnet and Portnet. Grindrod has got port operations in Mozambique, in Maputo, which have done record volumes. So as companies in this country, particularly exporting uh, hard commodities like coal, ferrochrome, iron ore, amongst others, have been unable to rail their products uh, to Durban or Richards Bay, where has it gone to? It's gone to Maputo, benefiting Grinrod. So it's done extremely well. Uh, the core earnings last year, if you look through all the accounting funnies, was one rand 42. So on the current share price of, of 10 rand, the stock is trading on a P of between six and seven. Public-private partnerships are gonna start kicking in in February next year. One of the major rail corridors is called uh, NAFCOR between Johannesburg and Durban. That uh, tender closed on the 31st of May, and the adjudication should occur in the next few months. Grinrod actually bid for that tender alongside its global shipping partner, Musk. And should Grinrod be successful in any of these rail tenders, alongside the port tenders it submitted for Durban, uh, it could be the spark that is needed to power the earnings growth inside this company. I've also gone on public record that with a net asset value of just over 12 Rand, the stock is trading at a discounted net asset value. Many of the old legacy assets like Grinrod Bank, uh, the pet food business, and the private equity assets amongst others have all been uh, shunted off. And the company is, is not debt free, but its balance sheet is much stronger than it was uh, a year or so ago. So in my rationale, Grinrod is one of those interesting vehicles currently. It is performing quite nice, thank you. The share price is trading at a very attractive price earnings ratio. Its underlying operations are benefiting from the collapse of the underlying state system. And unless you magically believe the government is going to get better uh, in the next year or two, Grinrod will continue to do quite well, as will all private operators in, uh, in logistics. And there's the spectre that if the public-private partnerships really do take off, but an international party like Dubai, Dubai Perth International or any of the large sovereign wealth funds or any of the major global shipping companies may come in and acquire one of the very few companies with underlying assets, expertise, and uh, uh, the skill set 
in rail and ports in this country and in fact in southern Africa. So in my mind, Grinrod is one of the most interesting, uh, interesting companies. It's a buy because it's cheap. It's a buy because the underlying economy it operates in is a disaster, which means it will benefit because it operates as a private network. And at some point, um, given its attractiveness, an international player could come in and swoop and buy the company. So I'm a Grinrod shareholder. I bought um, after Rembrandt uh, unbundled its 25% stake in late September, October last year. And it's certainly not a stock that I'm selling anytime soon. I have a target value on Grinrod of 14 Rand as I speak. Let me scroll down again, see what else has come through. There's lots coming through here. Um, bear with me, so I've got to read all of these things. There's lots and lots and lots and lots. Let me try and pick ones that are, that are fairly common. Uh, I've, okay, there's, there's uh, three questions on Libstar. Again, not giving anything away. Uh, if you buy the financial mail tomorrow with the investors monthly supplement, there's a two page special feature on what I call uh, food for thought. Uh, and I write in there which companies I believe have the potential to be takeover targets in what has been a rapidly declining food producer sector. The food producer sector or J357 as it's, as it's called on the JSC has been one of the worst performing sectors of the JSC for the last two years. Um, any of you would follow my research both uh, from my institutional perspective and from my publications in magazines and forums like this will know I've been neck short or in layman's terms, I have not liked the food sector for the best part of two years. I've favored the agricultural sector, which has been the best place to be. In the middle of last year, I also went uh, positive on the fishing sector, which has done me quite well. I have no reason whatsoever to change my stance on the food producer sector uh, in the time being. Libstar from memory year to date is one of the worst performing food counters. I think uh, for my FM article, it was down 35%. And it was the worst performing counter of Tiger Brands, AVI, Rhodes, and then Libstar. Why could that be? One, because its area of operation is in what I would call the constrained middle market. Many of the products it supplies go to Woolworths, Pick and Pay, and Checkers, which is a mid market. And we all know the mid market consumer is being constrained by higher interest rates, higher food price inflation, higher mortgage rates etc 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 and as such something has to give and there's been a, a lower level of sales of certain products of those mainstream mid to high lsm consumers uh, sorry companies in the last few months the results that have come out from the likes of woolworths pick and pay amongst others have clearly indicated that the middle market is being squeezed we've also seen at libstar they've had load shedding costs which have uh, eaten into their profits and with all food companies, load shedding has a significant impact on the production of products, depending on the mix, and as such, the impact to the margin. They've also had problems with Denny Mushrooms and at their home care and personal um, uh, products brand. So Lipstar, sadly, has uh, not done as well as I imagined. I think the share price today was at another 52-week low, uh, trading at around 3.50, 3.60. Um, on a valuation basis, it can be seen to be extremely cheap. And we've also got the spectre of a PIC selling. The second largest shareholder in Libstar is the PIC after private equity. Uh, private equity owns around 37% of Libstar, and the PIC from memory owns about 11%. The PIC in the last two months have been aggressive sellers of the mid-cap food stocks. They aggressively sold their stake in Rhodes. They halved the stake. They sold their stake in Sea Harvest. They halved that. And they still sit on an 11% stake on Libstar. They've been, they've been selling on the periphery. But if they ever decide to turn the taps on Libstar, I would become quite concerned. So Libstar is a June interim results period. I'm anticipating at some point in mid to late July, a, a voluntary update will be coming regarding first half performance. I'm not expecting a great set of results, 
in that a company could actually disappoint quite heavily, uh, very much alongside the results we have seen from every other single food company to date. But saying that, depending on what level that you were in, or if you're looking to buy the stock for recovery, I can tell you that many of my institutional clients uh, who have been aggressive buyers of Libstar under four rand as, are buying the stock for recovery. It's not every day you can get to buy a quality mid-cap food business, which has got leading market shares in certain product categories like dairy, which are some of the fastest growing food categories in the country, despite uh, the current economic travails we place in. They also have a very nice relationship with Woolworths and Checkers and a nice little export market in terms of products uh, into Saudi Arabia, which is from Finlar Foods, which is, which is schnitzel business. And then a huge herbs and spice business into pretty much uh, Western Europe, the States, and into Japan. And with a RAND materially weaker year on year, once their RAND hedge starts to get renegotiated in the second half of this year, they will make a great deal of money on their exports. So sadly, I would say that Libstar is one of those classic stocks. It's taken enormous pain in the first six months of this year. And the update coming uh, for the first six months will not be a, a, a kind update. The second half should see a significant rebound. And uh, if I was a gambler, and I hate gambling, um, I would use any material weakness in Libstar. Uh, if I had some uh, money lying around, which is prepared to go on risk, and I would buy Lipstar anything below three rand fifty. Um, what could it go to? If a PRC starts selling, it'll it'll just keep on going down, maybe below three rand. If a PRC, like many other institutions, are holding firm, then I think the share price could easily recover to north of five rand. But I would wait until the trading update, and on that trading update, I would then decide what to do. Let me just check the time. It is currently quarter to eight. I have gone over time. And let me just check if there's any more questions uh, that have come in late and I'll answer maybe just one or two more. Um, any thoughts on Altamin? I don't cover that. I've just discussed Grinrod and I've just discussed Libstar. So I think from myself, uh, I said that I'd answer as many questions and answers that I could uh, in this extended period. Please apologies for the, uh, the dusky light that I'm in. I'm working here on a little on a little light, given there's load shedding and Romans by. I hope that this um, update uh, with my friends from Rand Swiss has added some value to your life. Talking about Renogen, Argent, Afrimat, Omnia, Oceana, Sea Harvest, amongst others. And I hope amongst the uh, comments that I've given you, there will be at least one or two stocks that you really want to do more um, present, uh, more work for yourself, and hopefully then invest for the longer term. From myself and my friends from Rand Swiss, have a safe and warm evening. I wish you a good night and I'll see you again in the next quarter. Please give your feedback to your friends at Rand Swiss. If there's any specifics that you want for the next webinar, which will be in September, I will gladly listen. If you want the time changed, if you want any specific thematics or any specific questions answered, send your questions through to Rand Swiss and I'll do my very best to answer the queries back in September. Take care and have a great evening.